It's like I know, I'm not feeling the buzz for some I reason. Felt it. Oh, you felt it? I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, welcome to this video. I don't know really what, what I'm doing here, but um, basically you're going to see uh, some stuff about sports futures, uh, a little segment about Kodak Elite Chrome slide film, and then also some music recommendations that I have, and finally tying it all together, but not really tying it all together with trying to understand why I'm making this video. So, thanks for watching. Let's this not is use the G word. <laughs> we're, so what we're doing right right now, this is, um, I'm, I'll take the lead on this. Yeah. Uh, I'm here with Mr. Economics and we're doing La Quiniela, which is a fiduciary uh, investment instrument uh, that's high risk. Uh, it, yeah, high risk, but it's uh, based on sports futures. So right. here we are. And this is the regulatory documentation that needs to be filled out. Right. This column was done by yours truly. Mm-hmm. I also did this one, I think. Okay. I can't remember. That's fine. Um, right. This one was done by Siham. Okay. This one was done by Evelyn. Okay. And then you need me to do the I next would one. like for you to do the All right. fifth column. So then I'll express my investment positions. Yes. Okay. So let's do Sevilla, Valladolid. All right. I'm going to say Advantage, Valladolid. All right. What about Valencia versus Osasuna? Uh, Valencia Sasuna, I'm gonna say a draw. All right. Gerona, Rayo Vallecano. All right. Gerona, Rayo Vallecano. Well, uh, Rayo Vallecano, mm -hmm. advantage. Okay, cool. That is a two. All right, now we got Barça, Getafe. Well, uh, yeah. I'm gonna short Getafe, so mm -hmm. advantage Barça. That's right. Español, Villarreal. Español, Villarreal. Um, I'm going to give it to Espanol. Cool. So this, th these games are difficult because these uh, teams are from, they participate in the Europa League, ah. right? So they're teams from all over Europe that did I not see. qualify for the Champions I League. See. Nevertheless, being judged on their merits, they've so been allowed like to we're, participate. We're going from the FTSE to the uh, S&P, basically. We're kind of switching. That's right. That's switching right. gears here. That's okay. right. So the first team, okay. is, the first matchup is yeah. Bodo Glimt, which is a Norwegian team, mm -hmm. against Oporto, which is a Portuguese team. I, I'm going to give it to Oporto. Yeah. I think. That's right. Yeah. All right. Then we have Nice mm -hmm. uh, versus Real Sociedad, which is a Spanish team from San Sebastián. Oh, Nice. Nice. Okay. Then we have Anderlecht versus Ferencvaros. That Dutch team could actually be a Deutsch team, could be German. I okay, don't know. Okay. I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna give it to. Um, I'm gonna give it to uh, the Dutch or the Deutsch. The the Teutonic Germanic tribes. Yeah. All right. So number one. Now we got Ajax versus Besiktas. Ajax is from Amsterdam. Besiktas oh. is from Istanbul, I believe. Okay, I'm going to give it to Ajax. Right. Besiktas is either from Istanbul or somewhere else in Turkey. Then we have Lyon, the French team, mm -hmm. Olympique de Lyon, versus Olympiakos, a Greek team. Right. Oh, I'm going to give it to Lyon. All right. And then the last matchup is Tottenham Hotspur, the London club, yeah. versus Karabag, which I think is from Azerbaijan. I mean, Tottenham, yeah. surely. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. This is taking place right. tomorrow, the 25th of September. All right, and that's when the results. Do you have the earnings report on the, oh. the that just landed? Yeah, I, I do. Um, the dividends average out to about zero per person. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, yes, there were uh, 10 stocks that performed well. Uh-huh. Um, for you? For me. Yeah. However, for uh, some other investors, they were not as lucky. Uh, ah. um, uh, one, um, a very uh, buttery investor had only uh, six stocks <laughs> that performed better than the S and P five hundred. I see. Um, the rest were between seven and eight. I see. Uh, nevertheless, the dividends, if you average it out, uh, it's about yeah zero point zero. Oh, beautiful. So, well, yeah. Well, I think next time uh, everything will perform uh, better. Better. So you, you're hoping for a, for a better uh, earnings period for, uh, in the next uh, 
earnings period. Yeah, I think we're in a bull market right now. Ah, uh, yeah. So you believe it's going to change? <laughs> yeah. To uh, to a oh no wait oh right we're in a bull market okay yes. so not a bear market but no a bull market. no okay, no I, so which leads me to believe that either this next earnings call will be very good and if mm -hmm. not then definitely the next one. <laughs> oh that's true that's true there's all, there's always the next one yeah that's very true cool. You're recording. <laughs> you might right. get something juicy. Yeah, so this roll of film was was incredible. It's the first time that I've shot slide film um, ever, I think. And the colors are just unbelievable. And I mean, I think you see that in the pictures. And for a while, I was wondering how much of it was the actual film, which is obviously expired, and how much was like any post-processing that was done uh, by the the lab that scanned the film so that's why i brought the actual positives because yes these are positives and not negatives i don't know if you can see that <laughs> the thing is it's like active track is enabled on your face <laughs> So the colors, oh wow, yeah, are the actual. But yeah, so you hadn't seen like you were like Never. thinking that this was like a negative, right? I, I thought those were like los negativos de toda la vida. You know what I mean? Yeah, but they look like actual. They are pictures. They, they look are like yeah, because because you would, and that's the whole. Claro. I mean, right? Ahí se ve muy bien. Sí, sí, sí. Yeah, so you. The colors definitely have a vintage vibe, and mm. it, I think they do have overall yes a purple hue, but they. It's still not distorted, it's still kind of representing in a very pleasing way. So it's a kind of a very pleasing kind of alteration to maybe what the film would have looked like originally while it was still not expired. Um, but no, I'm, I'm really, it's like, these are some of the best photos I've taken on film. I, I so. agree. And um, do you recommend for people to buy this and let it expire? Oh, that's a good. Well, so the thing is that right now, <laughs> that's a good question. So slide film isn't really being produced anymore, as far as I'm aware. There might be like one film stock that's still like, because like nobody is really using uh, slide projectors anymore. But the thing is that um, slide film is was slept on while it was still being produced <laughs> because it has a kind of a more vivid color reproduction than uh, negative film. Unlike negative film though, it's um, generally less tolerant of being overexposed. However, because this was expired, I still overexposed it by a stop. And I feel that I was like, well, either it's gonna come out rubbish or it's gonna, you know, it's gonna translate. So you said that it was expired over 10 years ago? Yeah. When did you buy it? I bought it with like, three, four months ago, five months ago. So that's the other thing is that normally what, with film, you want to keep it in a fridge or sometimes even a freezer in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but this I keep, I kept in the fridge because then that slows down the um, expiration process, basically the degradation of the chemicals. Because I shot, I've shot another roll of, of slide film, um, which I don't have, I'm not gonna show here now, but it's uh, Agfa Precisa CT, which apparently is re-rolled Fujifilm, but that's also slide film from a different brand. And that one came out pretty greenish and what I would consider a more traditional expired look. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that that film I got in a bargain bin, God knows how it was stored. Yep. Um, just like the literally the bare roll, it wasn't even boxed or anything. Right. Um, and it, it was like five bucks, so I was willing to roll the dice. And I still like the results, but I mean, the results from this uh, Elite Chrome 100 just really blow it out of the water in just pure like uh, technical um, terms and in terms in terms of the, like the the pleasing color. I just wanted to highlight two records that I've been uh, playing these past couple of days. The first one is this Seize the Beat compilation uh, on Z Records, or Z Dance, rather. And yeah, I mean, you might 
recognize some names here, was not was, and uh, also there's a track by Material. And I'm just going to read a little bit uh, from the back cover written by Vince Aletti, who wrote the Disco Files, so very much a New York disco journalist, if you will. So here he says that from its inception, Z Records has been a champion of the musically bizarre, picking up and transmitting signals from the outer limits. As the home of the left field record, haven for the outlaw avant-garde, the label has an apparent, sometimes astonishing, reckless dedication to the unusual and the adventurous. This is a very cool compilation. I'd say for me, this is like a party record. This is a New York party record. If you're looking for something off the beaten path, but they're still groovy, they're still fun, then uh, can't go wrong with this. Obviously retro from the late 70s. Uh, well, late 70s? No, let's see, 81. So yeah, kind of very early 80s, that time where disco was in crisis. So yeah, after the Disco Sucks rally and all of that, back when disco was kind of mixing it up with uh, punk, kind of dirty disco, if you will. But I think, I don't know, I mean, the stuff that's here is definitely more disco than punk overall, I would say. But it's taking disco into uh, a very exciting kind of space. Basically, I just pulled these two records from my record collection, so there's no rhyme or reason as to why I'm talking about these records. I just played them these past couple of days, so I'm talking about them. Um, this next one is more modern, still very much in the New York vibe. Uh, it's WT Records, and it's kind of their more sort of DJ-friendly uh, series called uh, No Posers came out in 2012 and it has Org Electronique that you might recognize from Holland, one of uh, Legovelt's buddies, Entro Sinistre from New York as well. Um, the other two artists I'm less familiar with, but yeah, if you're looking for like some, um, again, dance music that doesn't take you for a fool, then I recommend this. Give it a listen. Also, this is probably, I mean, both of these records probably are available on digital or on YouTube. If I find the links, I'll pop them down below. But obviously I can't play the music on here because otherwise YouTube is gonna just rip me a new one. So, uh, so yeah, I'm just telling you that these are cool records to check out in case you didn't know about them. Okay, then the next thing, yeah, the next thing that I wanted to talk about was um, kind of like why I'm recording these videos, because I'm trying to figure out how often I can make them and how kind of time intensive they are to kind of put together. So the findings are in yeah. and they are way too time intensive. So I can't, I've decided that probably once every two weeks, and that's being optimistic, I think, more realistically, probably once every month is is the way to do it. But the reason why I'm, I'm doing this is because like ever since I did the interview uh, with with Pepe, the, uh, Pepe Badia Marrero, the very talented insect photographer, I kind of realized that that was a video that I made that if only 10 people watched it, I would be happy with it because I was really happy to make it. And it was a lot of work, but I was very happy to make it. So, I mean, I've been doing YouTube videos for over 10 years and I've been sort of trying to keep a cadence of like one a week. And with that in mind, they've kind of been pretty short, um, but also it's been like a main focus of my, like my free time was to just produce uh, the videos. And now I've kind of reached the point, like especially with the way that sort of social media networks, um, just online life has evolved with the whole kind of rot economy, where essentially it's very clear that uh, Google, Facebook and company, Ooh. yeah, they basically suck at their intended purpose. And as much as they kind of decried the idea of the middleman, 
early on in their in their life, kind of the, um, the in their life as companies, they are middlemen and kind of pretty bad middlemen at that. Um, in the sense that for you know YouTube, Facebook, and so on, if or let's take Facebook for example, if their intended purpose was to bring people together or connect people, like they spectacularly fail at that now. Um, and the same thing with uh, with Google, if like their intended purpose was like oh to help you find information, um, then they have gotten progressively worse uh, over time. At the same time, there's a lot of people who kind of focus on like the metrics and like oh what do I have to do to to get like more eyeballs on my content uh, and so on. And I'm at the point where like, yes, to a certain extent, you can do things for that to happen. But then that's, that's a job. Uh, in fact, it's kind of in many ways a job that I used to do for like a regular salary, except um, on YouTube, it's, it's something that I do because I want to express myself. So at the same time, YouTube is like, is designed so that in, you know, when you log in as a, as a video uh, creator, you have access to like the number of views, the, num the how long people watch your videos, all these kinds of metrics that suck you in and then kind of reinforce certain assumptions that you might have. Assumptions that generally are wrong because there's, in my opinion, little rhyme or reason to kind of what works so to speak, and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And um, anyways, to cut a long story short, I've decided just to do what I like, when I like to, instead, instead, of, instead of like wasting my time in essentially what is Kremlinology, trying to guess what the mighty algorithm might be thinking, might not be thinking, and so on. There's people who do that professionally, um, but it's not how I want to spend my time. So. With that in mind, that's why kind of you're filming now because it's. I personally don't enjoy filming myself that much. I mean, I do it because I want to kind of express myself, but it's pretty lonely. It's pretty boring. Um, it's pretty like, kind of like recursive in, in many ways. So then that's the thing that I realized when I interviewed uh, Pepe was um, this is fun. Element. Yeah, this is fun. This yeah. is like it's cool. Yeah. There's an exchange. No, and it's so there's like noticeable. Yeah. In that interview. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I just want to do more of that. And uh, not the, I, at the same time, I like the videos that I've made so far, um, but I just don't want it to become a job, especially for a channel that is pretty small and that is not, it's not my job. And that's the bottom line.